Welcome back, one and all. It is Thursday, December 28th, 2017. It is our classic movie discussion and our last show of the calendar year. The next time you'll see us, it'll be 2018. And it's, of course, the No Name Cinema Society. And we're here to review The Last Emperor tonight. Hello, everybody. My name is Jonathan Betzler. I am one of your hosts for the evening. Uh, and I'm very excited. Back here in my own apartment in Los Angeles what, for what feels like the first time in a long time. And we've got, I introduced her in the last episode a little bit. I've got one of my new friends here. Emma Stone's going to join us for, for her show. And since we're doing uh, introductions, let me continue with uh, our, our old standby, my eunuch in waiting, Davy Joseph. How are you, Davy? You know, you shouldn't do that thing with your nose that you were just doing. You're going you're gonna to mess up that beautiful face. My nose itches sometimes. Not only do we have Davy, but we have another yeah. new member with us as we expand the society. Um, he's uh, yeah. representing rep representing the gingers. He's our redheaded tutor brought in to teach me about life uh, and being a leader. Ladies and gentlemen, James Monahan is our new member, and he's going to do an entrance here. There he is. That was it. It was, it was a short <laughs> elevator ride into the show. <laughs> As you can see, I'm broadcasting from the Forbidden City. <laughs> And the first time they've led in a Westerner, let alone a ginger, into the Forbidden City in a long time. <laughs> but it took live. a lot of coordination. We broke I in. Bet. Here. I bet. Live from Forbidden City. James, incidentally, is uh, one, of, uh, one of the directors on our web series, Intersection, along with myself and, uh, and Minnie Tran and Richard Atkinson. We, we directed a web series you can look find on YouTube, uh, Intersection. James, welcome to the No Name Cinema Society. Hey, it's great to be here, Jonathan. Thanks for uh, inviting me. It's great to meet you, Emma Stone. That's right. Fellow ginger. And fellow ginger, she's excited to meet you as well. It's time she for can, what she are we drinking? Jealous. She can be jealous of another handsome, uh, good-looking ginger in the room. I don't know. Sorry, Emma. Not, not going to be jealous. Um, so it's time <laughs> for what are we drinking. I, I'm working on, I'm going to open this. Uh, I just got some Angel City since I'm still in LA uh, for Angel the next couple City. weeks. Angel City uh, IPA is going to be my drink of choice for the evening. James, I don't yeah. suppose you're going to join me in, in a little wine or brewski. I've got some solid H2O right here, baby. Yeah. The hard stuff. Davey, Davey does too, even though he's not living up to his nickname. Are you both in LA? Uh, Davey's in Philadelphia at the moment, I believe. Aren't you, Davey? Hey, Philly. <laughs> <laughs> the way you've got your shot set up tonight, Davey, I feel like you're in that Jamiroquai video where the wall keeps going and going and going. I'm going to run around the walls and stuff later. It's going to be awesome. Watch to yeah, the no, end be... or you'll miss it. <laughs> That's right. Watch the whole video so you can see Davey redo the Jamiroquai video. Before we do that, let me tell you the schedule. This is part of our 45th series of episodes. Last week, a week ago tonight, we did another last movie. We did The Last Jedi, our annual Star Wars movie review and discussion. Just a couple days ago, two days ago, the day after Christmas, December the 26th, we did our Indie Spotlight, which is How to Survive a Plague, the documentary from 2012. Tonight, we're celebrating the 30-year anniversary of the Best Picture winner, The Last Emperor. And on next Tuesday, January 2nd, our first show of the calendar year 2018, but still part of our third season, we're going to do our 29th sound off in which we're going to play some games. Ooh. I'm going to do an obscure, obscure movie reference. Davey has tasked me with counting down the top five performances in a Star Wars movie. Number one, Dom uh, Hall Gleason, my favorite okay. ginger actor. I'm not going to give away whether he's number one or not. You have to tune in on Tuesday. <laughs> I'm sure he is. I'm, sure. I'm going to predict. I'm going to predict right now that that number one is going to be better than your number one. <laughs> <laughs> not a stretch. Not a stretch. <laughs> Davey doesn't have much faith. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, this day in history, December 28th, historically, on this day in 1958, and this one's for Davey, it was the greatest game ever played, or what they call the greatest game ever played in football. The Baltimore Colts beat the New York Giants 24-17 in the NFL championship game. It was the first sudden death game in NFL history. Usually they just ended in ties. 17 Hall of Famers would play in this game. 1964, on this day, the principal photography bin begins on Dr. Zhivago which you might remember is in my top 10 all time. We discussed the film in episode six, if you want to go back and look at that episode. Also in this day in history, 1990, which is one of our years that we studied closely a couple years ago. Uh, on this day, December 20th, there was a big subway electrical fire on the Clark Street stop in Brooklyn. Two people died, 188 oh, people injured. Jeremy, I live in New York. James, I, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you. What were you saying? No, you... <laughs> sorry, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> that was my that was my subtle way of hinting that you interrupted me. But go ahead. I you know, know I, I hadn't I didn't even pick up on it. It was so slow. <laughs> When when JB I, burns I mean, from it's like right, a match, it's like uh, it's like boiling a frog. I will always come to you for comments, so don't worry. Don't you don't need to like throw them in there. I will I will seek okay, your great. words. <laughs> Any, do you have anything on that Clark Street fire? Had you heard about that before? Are you talking to me now? <laughs> yeah, talking do we to need you. to raise our hand here? Do I need to... <laughs> no, not necessarily. What do you think about the, that uh, Clark Street fire? I hadn't heard of it till just now. I didn't. When did this happen? 1990, on this day in history, 1990. I, wa I wasn't here. Um, I was on the West Coast. My parents forbade me from applying to any New York colleges because they thought I'd get mugged like the instant I landed. But now New York is a much safer place except for the occasional. I mean, that's I've never heard a subway electrical fire like that. That, that's, that was an extreme thing when I discovered that. So birthdays, it is the 63rd birthday of one Denzel Washington. Birthday, December 28th. Davey incorrectly predicted Denzel would win the Best Actor Oscar last year for Fences. He lost to Casey Affleck for Manchester by the Sea, which Jay Money and I both predicted correctly. Denzel has won two Oscars historically. He won Best Supporting Actor in 1989 for the film Glory and 2001 film Training Day, directed by Antoine Fuqua. Guys, that's this day in history. Anything either of you want to say about that? No, that was very informative. Davey, anything on Denzel and your poor prediction last year? I'll tell you what, they do a game over, he wins. Uh, uh, oh, because of all the harassment? I think so. Talk? I would be vindicated if they redid that. Maybe there's a third option altogether instead of either one of them. So it's time for our trivia tidbit that I hinted on the last episode when we talked about Lolita. I said that tonight we were going to discuss the 30th anniversary of the first PG-13 film to win Best Picture. The PG-13 rating was instituted in 1984 after film like Gremlins and the Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom got parents in an uproar. But they were certainly not our films, but they felt they were too much to be PG, so they, they met in the middle a little bit with this PG-13 rating. Does anybody know that the first film to get the PG-13 rating? Davey, you want to hazard a guess? I used to know this. I don't remember. James? Gosh. Uh, it wasn't like Back to the Future or something, though. No? No, Back to the Future was 1985, uh, and Back to the Future actually had a PG rating, not PG-13. Um, the answer is Red Dawn, uh, the film with Patrick Swayze. Wow. was the very wow. first film ever to receive a PG-13 rating in late, I think it was October of 1984, I want to say. Back so, to uh, the Future should have had PG-13. You think so? Why? Why is that? Because of the Oedipal content. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. That's a really good I point. Think. <laughs> you think so? Do we have to do the show? Can we just chat? This is fun. <laughs> Is, no, it's time to start shirt, The Last Emperor, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a summary. You guys ready to summarize? I guess. Systems go. All right, here we are with the summary for The Last Emperor. Pu Yi is three years old when he is made to be Emperor of China, which by the time he is nine or ten, he realizes is something of an empty title. China is a republic now, but inside the Forbidden City, which he as the emperor is not allowed to leave, Everyone maintains the traditions and lavish lifestyle of the old world. As Pu Yi gets older, so does China. Going through regime change after regime change, coup d'etat after coup d'etat, all outside the walls of the city. Finally, one coup breaks with tradition and breaches the sacred walls of the Forbidden City, forcing the ruler in name only to brave the outside world as he searches for a way to maintain power that he may have never really had. Guys, that was a little longer summary. How do you guys feel about that summary, Davey? That was good. It's a longer movie, so that makes sense. Okay. James, how was that summary? <laughs> that was good. Just reminded me how I hate when coups break my walls down. <laughs> it's a problem. It, it, it happens from time to time. Um, all right. So, guys, it's time for opening thoughts. Um, one sentence or so. Uh, since it's James's first show, I want to let Davey show him how it's done. Opening thoughts on The Last Emperor. I, I Here I thought they spoke Chinese in China. <laughs> Ooh. I had a note on that coming up, so there you go. All right, so that's that's a hint of what Davy thinks about. I don't know where to put that on the Davy scale, James. I think it was a beautiful, sweeping, uh, complicated film filmed in a gorgeous location that unfortunately features a protagonist that is a little bit distant from us, a cipher who's not that exciting and not that likable. But at the end of the day, the uh, the reason to watch it is is for the imagery. Well, it, it was a long sentence, but it was one sentence. So you met the criteria. <laughs> Sorry. 
in terms of the screening that I had, I screened this in New York City on March 26th of 2017. So this year, about nine months ago, almost exactly. And it, it similarly had sort of a lukewarm, uh, it similarly had sort of a lukewarm reception. Uh, are, I find it visually breathtaking with zero emotional engagement. Um, and generally on this show, James, we start with the positive. And I do want to say uh -huh. some nice things about the, the direction and that's sort of what a little bit. And I, I want to start with uh, design. And, and uh, Davey, I'm surprised you had an opportunity to use your favorite catchphrase about color palette. You didn't bring up the color palette at all. And this is almost the perfect movie to talk about the color palette. I know. I think, I think you're right. It is. It definitely is. One thing design-wise I particularly liked is how the color varied. There's sort of three sections to the film. Forbidden City, Manchu Kuo versus 50s Manchuria. The color palette changed drastically. The monochromatic Manchuria in, in 1950 through 1959 and the opulence and color of the Forbidden City in 1908 through 1920 or something like that. James, anything on the color palette? Well, look, you've got one of the best cinematographers ever, Vittorio Storaro, doing this film. I do want to dig deeper into cinematography, but I think yeah. it's more than just the cinematography. Well, I think the costumes and the production design, I think it's, you know, it's an overall vision here, which is why I put it under sort of the category of direction. Well, I, yeah, but I brought up Vittorio because he put so much thought into colors, maybe more than anyone else. I think I came across an essay he wrote on The Last Emperor where he came up with symbolism for every color in the film. I don't have that in front of me, but he had a little paragraph about what each color meant. Did but, you research uh, this paper uh, for tonight, or did you? this is something you saw long ago? Uh, it was a while back. I mean, uh, I forgot what it was, but uh, an essay, like a book of essays by cinematographers. But uh, yeah, it'd be cool to look up. But yeah, obviously, this is a collaborative effort helmed by Bertolucci, but really helped by the fact that they scored the Forbidden City, you know, first, first <laughs> to Western get into this ready-made place. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And that's almost part of why I think it won the Oscar, just sort of the sheer audacity of shooting there and, and sort of being a trailblazer of, of that kind. I also think relations with China were, were distant, at, more distant at the time. I mean, like, now it's suspicious, but then it was just like, it, you know, like there was little to no relationship with China. And so it was a country that the world didn't know too much about. So or at least Americans didn't know too much about. So it, it, it was very much of interest at the time in, in that regard. As far as Storaro is concerned, I did have this section on cinematography because in addition to the color, I thought that what he did in terms of framing was really outstanding, um, particularly as it relates to use of foreground elements. Almost everyone is obscured from Puyi's perspective. Everyone, everything, except RJ maybe, is hidden from him. There are constant barriers between him and others, almost reinforcing his separation from the world. James, what do you think about the framing? This is classic Hollywood filmmaking as I see it, just real, you know, fluid camera. He's not willy-nilly about where his camera moves. And I, and I read that Bertolucci is really hands-on, by the way, as an operator. Like in America, cinematographers often operate or they have an operator. But Bertolucci himself likes to be behind the camera, even on the dolly, even on the cranes. And it's sweeping. I mean, it's, it's appropriately sweeping the camera because this is an epic. You know, it's grand. This is cinema well, on yeah. the grandest scale you can, you can think of. You, you touched on my very next two notes, which were elegant camera movement, which you sort of talked about, uh, and the fluidness of it. So you covered that. And also, yeah, epic wide shots. That, and, and I think it's the sweepingness of it that you talked about. It's super well choreographed uh, in that regard, which a lot of epics don't necessarily know how to do. It earned those big moments. Um, like Bertolucci and Storaro, they knew how to maximize visual impact in those moments. And with the level of detail, uh, that is outstanding, and uh, a lot of, they're very good at reveals. Um, and I've got an example here, I've got a clip for you guys, which is one of the more famous clips from the movie that I think James was referencing earlier. Um, this is the coronation scene from The Last Emperor, it happens pretty early in the movie. Uh, check it out and you'll see a lot of the things that we're talking about. Yeah. 
呀，苦啦，飞。This clip has a lot of what we're talking about. I, I mean, the color scheme, obviously, um, and the way the fluid camera movement and the, the details, you know, whether it's the stamp or, you know, the, the, the costumes or the fingers that the women are wearing uh, and, you know, or the cricket or things like that. And uh, the way they reveal the, the followers or, or uh, you know, constituents, uh, Units. subjects. Yeah, in in and then in this big wide shot and all the colors there, uh, you know, and the sheet is a cool idea because it sort of reveals you know the city behind him. So that sort of that that sort of encapsulates a lot we're talking about. Um, Davey, you know, whether it's a clipper, you haven't chimed in about the cinematography overall. What do you think? I know. I think I the I, I think that definitely the my the the part of the movie that I enjoy the most is the is the first uh, third because that's where the colors are most vibrant. You get the shots of the of the city, and it, the movie hasn't become so heavy yet, I guess. And I think a lot of that is due to these kinds of shots, and maybe just the capturing of how how innocent of a kid he is, even though you can tell right off the bat that he's not particularly thrilled about this situation. And that clip contains a shot that you see in every montage that. Is supposed to show off the glories of cinema of the young boy running out from interior to exterior and first he's framed by the threshold there and then he runs out like you say into that orange canopy i'm curious how deliberate that color orange was for the team because i know vittorio you know is very specific about color i'm sure particularly which he is too and then it continues what was surprising about that shot is it keeps going and the camera starts moving in unexpected ways, and Which then you so, reveal. It's so hard to light interior yeah. and exterior in the same shot, as you know. Like yeah. the exposure goes crazy, so it's that's a big challenge, and they needed a lot to get that done. I mean, that's so that's also impressive in its own right. Yeah. So the first third of that shot is enough, but then we reveal like this, you know, whole hundreds, if not thousands, of people there. I mean, to coordinate all that must must have been right. And fun. that's sort of the blocking and the choreography that I was talking about. That's why I used it as an example. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's it's impressive, and I think one of the things, to Davy's point, that makes the film special and 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 why it's remembered in some ways. Um, uh, uh staying behind the, you know, below the line, if you will, a little bit. Um, the score, uh, is something that I initially enjoyed. Like, I, it's musically really interesting, but I find it overused. Ultimately, um, it got to be a little grating. Like, it was got to be too much swelling. Like I felt like they went to the well too many, one too many times on that. Uh, James, anything on the score? I don't. Rec 
call that much of the score, which is probably a good sign. Uh, so it kind of matched the emotions of the film. But I noticed uh, one of the names on there is David Byrne, right? Is that David Byrne, the famous David Byrne from Talking Heads? Fascinating guy. Um, yeah. And they won an Oscar for that, I assume? I think they did. They won all nine yeah. Oscars they were nominated yeah. for. Yeah, I, I didn't think check they won. Eh? Did they guess? They pretty much won every below the line category. So I, 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 I it, think it's a safe know, bet. You know, a lot of films back in the 80s started experimenting with, you know, synthesizers, and sometimes the synths would be out of place, especially in a period film. Luckily, they didn't do that, because I think it would have been distracting. It was almost like a traditional kind of score, and this is almost a directorial choice. I'd have no issue with the music itself. I mean, I have issue with the amount of cues and how similar the cues were at certain moments. Uh, you know, every time he was abandoned, they played the same you know, kind of theme, and, and it, it was abandoned so much, or, you know, people were constantly leaving him, it really got to be too much. There's a balance, you know, when you overuse something, it gets to be annoying. Like, I feel like, it, you know, it needs to be a little more careful. David, did you notice anything about the score? I absolutely noticed the same thing. By the end, by the end of the movie, it, it feels almost like a, a video game uh, song. Hmm. Like, you just, you've heard it so many times like oh this is the song that gets played when you when your guy dies like, when, when you defeat the world yeah exactly yeah, right. that, that's a really good analogy well you get um, to the end you get to the end and someone says sorry your emperor is in another castle <laughs> <laughs> we should totally yeah. make the last emperor in a video game yes. that would be cool <laughs> I guess we'll get to this when we talk about the story, but you mentioned how many times this poor guy is abandoned. <laughs> Just one yeah. abandonment I'm, I'm, another. I'm, I'm, saving that, I'm saving that to the end because that's right. where I really have my issues. So, uh, so, so I'm sort of, I'm, I'm doing the nice things and then going, uh, and the last real nice thing I have to say is the sound design <laughs> along, along the same line of score. Uh, I thought the sound design and, you know, sound Oscars, are, are ge generally technical Oscars and not really about, and James can maybe speak to this a little bit because he, he and I have used the same sound designer. They're not really about the creative ideas behind the sound. And I think that's really where the art is. And this, as far as like creative sound design, this was very good. And the sounds coming from outside the city being a constant presence, I thought was a really a terrific idea in hammering home that point. James, anything on sound design? Well, first I, I got to say that just on the, topic of all this technical stuff i watched this film on a laptop and you know what it's the first time i've ever seen it i've never seen it in a theater i so want to see it in a theater now i mean because it looks amazing and i'm sure it, it sounds great i mean it, i think it won an oscar for sound as well yeah like you were saying the sound design helps tell the story of a guy who's isolated and imprisoned in his own lavish opulent uh, palace here where he can hear what's going on outside and it's great because it gets his imagination but also our imagination going like what the hell is going obviously when they start hearing violent sound it's like oh my god there's turmoil up there is it coming for me the emperor wonders probably and eventually it does davy anything on the sound design before we move on uh you know it didn't I, it wasn't something that i i, I keyed in on no, and it's not something we normally talk about, and it's it's a very subtle art form, but I, I thought it was particularly well used here. So, I, I mean, I'll move on, because I, and I don't have much to say about performances either. Touch briefly on performances. It'll segue nicely into this screenplay. Now, this is a rare Best Picture winner with zero acting nominations. It won everything was nominated for, nine for nine. It's very rare to have a Best Picture winner not even have a single nomination in an acting category. John Lone, Joan Chen, and Peter O'Toole were all good, solid performances. But the storytelling structure and script didn't really allow for their characters or their performances themselves to really blossom. I thought they were fine. They were good. Not exceptional. But I don't know if the script and the direction that Bertolucci was choosing really gave them an opportunity there. Um, Davey, anything on the performances? You know, I was going to say the same thing. I thought everyone did a did a good job at their... Uh... You know, I, I I was just trying to think of who would get nominated, and I can't I can't think of anyone. I don't have any complaints, but I can't think of anyone that that really could have been nominated here either. Yeah, maybe Peter O'Toole, but that would be more like of a you know icon nomination. Yeah, uh, James, uh, do you disagree? Yeah, why wouldn't you give a nomination to John Lone? I think you're right that the character kind of hampers the performance because his character is a cipher, right? We're really kind of distant from him. He's not the most likable person in the world either. It's a performance of subtlety and longevity as well. I mean, we cover many years of this guy's life, but I think within that framework, he did an excellent job. Okay. He did as I good mean, of a job I, as I he could have. I don't think he did a bad job. 
Yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call it exceptional, and I don't know if I, it would make my list of the final five from 1987. You know, it's a year of Michael Douglas in Wall Street, for example, as Gordon Gecko. Also, uh, Robin Williams in Good Morning Vietnam was another nominee that year. That's a performance I would put ahead of John Lone here. And I don't think it's a bad performance. I'm glad that you liked it. I just didn't necessarily think it was exceptional. I'm getting the impression you like this movie a little more than either Davey or I. I like aspects of it. Do you think if John Lone's character were white and it was a white actor, he might have been nominated? Sorry. No, I don't think that is any, I don't think, I personally don't think it has anything to do with it. Davey, do you think it's a racism thing? Uh, no, but I, I, I think that I might have been skeptical if O'Toole had gotten nominated. I was thinking about saying that when you asked about him before. So no, no, I, I, I don't. It boils down to one main issue for me. Uh, just like L.A., it's about sprawl, A-W-L. Film covered too much ground, plain and simple, as far as I'm concerned. It's an easy complaint, but I think it's true here. We talk about it from time to time in the show. Films buried by their own ambition. We are never really able to emotionally dig into any one thing because we're always having to move on to the next thing, which is not to say the film moves fast. It just doesn't dig deep on just about anything at all. I'm going to let Davey go first because I think he agrees with me, and we'll see what James disagrees. I don't entirely agree with you. I, I, I feel like... I feel like I was, uh, I, I would have been okay with, uh, you know, I, I'm okay with skipping years and, and, and jumping uh, time. I, for whatever reason, early on in the film, I was having a bit of a hard time following it a bit. I, I, it, and that's, it, that, that's my next issue, actually. So that's yeah, coming up. I think that for whatever reason, maybe, I don't know, if it, I guess it's an editing issue. I think if it was done a little bit more coherently, it, it wouldn't have bothered me. The sprawl wouldn't have been the issue. But I think those things go hand in hand, quite frankly. Because it was so sprawling and they were moving on and they weren't digging deep, they weren't able to be as clear on certain things. Clarity is a key issue, in particular as it relates to the politics of the film. The politics mm. were very confusing to me at times, and I, this is the second time I've watched it this year. I feel like details were passed over and regimes, and, and maybe that was part of the point, that regimes were not defined these warlords and are mentioned in passing and it's a little confusing and I wonder if the film wouldn't have been stronger if they just focused on the Forbidden City or perhaps more interestingly the Japan situation might have been more interesting on its own. Um, I haven't decided but uh, I, 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 before I got to James since you brought up the clarity issue I wanted to bring that up as, as well. Um, and I mean like along the same lines Davey characters come out of nowhere in this movie with little to no explanation. Nothing feels explored enough. James. You know, I watched the uh, the cut that came out in theaters, right? 163 minutes. And I understand there was a much longer cut that aired on television, like almost an hour or more of footage. But in a rare case, uh, Bertolucci actually prefers the shortcut. He thinks that's his director's cut, I understand. I'm curious what they cut out. James did some research before coming on tonight. I did, I did. Is that totally forbidden? It's verboten. Uh, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's rarely done. I'm just not used to it. I'm He's not, just used, not used to it, right? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not used to being out trivia. I was just curious because I had heard how long this film was, and so I was kind of scared about watching it. But it held my attention. But I felt like, especially in the latter half, which I actually found more interesting than the Forbidden City part, things felt really choppy. And it seems like a lot of complex history is going on in the latter half of the film. But my guess is some stuff got chopped up, including like transitional elements that might have made things clearer. Even yeah. the short version, I assume Davey also watched the, the 160 minute version. Um, even the short version feels too long. Do you disagree, Davey? The movie that it reminds me of is the Batman versus Superman. Like it, it's, it's, Wow, long, I, that, I still that is an analogy I did not expect. <laughs> too long, but I still don't understand what's happening. So I almost want more to maybe because it would make some sense at that point. You know, well, uh, I mean, like they were so worried about the opulence and the visual. Like it's it's they prioritized the visual, the visuals over the basic elements of storytelling. I'm sorry to say, is the best picture yeah, winner. Maybe it's true. absolutely. Blasting. I I I absolutely agree. I think. Story-wise, the Forbidden City parts are the least compelling, partially because we're always kept so distant from this child. He's also a narcissistic kid and a real brat. I think he's meant to be, so we're not like down on his yeah, level. Yeah, I, I don't like that so much because he, he's so young. Like, uh, if you're spoiled from the age of two on, I, you'd be a brat too. No, 
I totally understand how he behaves, but you know, aren't there a couple other Best Picture uh, nominees this year that are uh, World War period dramas that are told from the point of view of a young child? Empire of the Sun and Hope and Glory. Empire of the Sun was not a Best Picture nominee. Oh, it wasn't? Okay. It came out there, right? It did. It did. Hope and Glory was nominated, however. Same year. That's what you get when you try to out trivia me. I take you down. That was impressive. Yeah. (laughs) The Japanese are also the bad guys in Empire of the Sun. It wasn't wasn't a good year for the Japanese. Do you think think because it was in the 80s and we were feeling the competition? There was a lot of jokes back then. I remember in school that, oh, everything's made in Japan. They're catching up to us in electronics. The Japanese were being portrayed as bad guys in these films this year. I don't know. Japan of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, they were pretty awful. It, yeah, they're horrible. I don't have any sympathy or feel like the film paints things no, of course. in an inappropriate way historically. I agree. There were certain elements in this film I wanted to see more of, actually. Like this character of the Eastern Jewel who shows up later. I did a little research and I found out she was absolutely real and just really fascinating. She was a spy, like she says in the movie. This androgynous in the film, she has a lesbian scene, of course. I don't know if that was true, but just a fascinating person. And we just get a glimpse of her. And I thought the performance was great from Maggie Han and wanted me to know more, wanted me to see a whole film about that character. A movie all about the Eastern Jewel might be great, but she came in so randomly and last minute that I was I was frustrated. Yeah. And she sort of came in as the wife number two came out. Like I was wondering, like it almost wanted you to lead you to believe, is this a year later and the wife number two is coming back as a pilot. Like what's happening. It was a little confusing and did not. And she was like a cousin, I guess, randomly of the emperor. So it was that, that I I like the idea of the character, but I almost feel like they like the idea of the character too. And, and try to shoehorn her into this thing. It sort of felt forced as well. And it's another issue I have with the screenplay and storytelling overall. Davey, anything on Eastern Jewel? Definitely one of the more shocking characters. I didn't see that one coming. In terms of like the homosexual overtones? Yeah, yeah really. I, I just, I guess it was interesting, but it, was, it wasn't really fleshed out enough. You know, maybe that, that kind of speaks to your points about the sprawl. I'm with James in the sense that if I had to choose which section I wanted to see a movie on, it would probably be the Japan section. And maybe that would bring out a little more Eastern Jewel. I was almost more interested in that. The only downside is it came later in the movie and it was like, after I was annoyed with some of the first half, but it was probably, it would probably make a more interesting movie than the kid in the Forbidden City movie. And that's probably where they should have focused their attention. And it would have been possibly more interesting overall. So that's, that's where I'm at in terms of reducing the sprawl. They could have, could have had more focus screenplay wise. You talked about how they, you know, tried to shoehorn stuff into the screenplay. I mean, one of the things they shoehorned in was they really tried to sex it up early in the film. We have, a threesome scene, which was kind of fun, with the emperor and his two uh, wives under the covers. But in real life, apparently, this emperor, he was kind of impotent, kind of asexual, and definitely not into women. He, he may have been a homosexual. Isn't that true of RJ as well? Is it? Oh, I thought saying. you did research here, man. You, I was relying on you. You did all this research, but you skipped RJ? I didn't care about the Westerner. <laughs> apparently not. The other thing I didn't like about the screenplay was the structure. The flashbacks in general didn't work for me. The transitions often felt forced. Also along the same lines, this interrogation stuff as exposition felt really contrived and also forced. James, anything on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a format and a structure and a framework that's you know been tried before. You know, my favorite film from the 80s as well is Amadeus. It's a similar format where it starts with a suicide, just like in The Last Emperor, that's and then proceeds with a kind of confession. And then we flash back from that confession. It's a good way to break things up. I mean, if we didn't have the intercutting, doing one section at a time linearly, that would be much worse, I think. That's top 15 for me all time, Amadeus. What What do you think about this last point about the structure? I'm wondering if maybe at least the first third of the film is kind of cut in a way to make it a little confusing because if you're... You know, if you take it from the point of the view of the of the emperor, you're not going to really understand what's going on as as a kid. So maybe they're you know trying to just give you uh, some observations of of oh new guy in charge of the you know new ruler of China, but maybe not explain anything. It's I don't know, from his I, perspective, so he wouldn't know some of the details, and so it's confusing. That's what you're saying. Really keep it. It was intentionally confusing for the for the viewer, maybe just to kind of give you that that feeling. I don't know. I'm if trying I, to give. If, you if I if I heard that in a meeting. Uh, you know, if I was in a meeting with the, the, the creative team and I heard that, I would, 
I might even quit the job. I would be so <laughs> but keep, but keep it ambiguous. Now it's one thing to be ambiguous. Mind. It's another thing to like purposefully leave them confused. Davey, before we get to the T word, I believe you wanted to talk about the lack of subtitling here. Everyone spoke English. You know, obviously it's kind of a bigger budget. I think they spent twenty something million. I think it was just too risky to go with the subtitles. They didn't pull the trigger on it, so they, they went with English. Does it not feel weird? It suffers. It suffers for it, absolutely. James? I now I'm cutting to you nodding, so you could. <laughs> so you. Oh can... yeah, it's 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 very disconcerting. And my question is, if it hadn't been in English, it had been in like the language they actually spoke, would it have been a foreign language film then? Right? It wouldn't have won all the Oscars. It it would, would have just won foreign. It, it might have still won the Oscars, but but, but maybe it. Uh, it, it, I don't it's know. An attack strong, I don't know. There seems to be a strong bias against you know foreign language films in those other categories, but. One has never won Best Picture, so you're right in that sense. I don't know if they really thought they were in the running for Best Picture at that time, because it's not like, you know, Bertolucci was constantly nominated. Like, he was nominated once before for Last Tango in Paris, 1973. It was not like he was a Hollywood guy, like a Scorsese guy, that was putting out Oscar-worthy content every year. So I don't know really how many decisions are made based on Oscars, you know what I mean? Maybe it was technology or whatever, but... It could have sounded more realistic, the dubbing. And also some uh, of the dialogue, and, which is very stilted, like what was coming out of the young kid's yeah. mouth sounded and like, for a movie that kid wouldn't say this? For a movie that won a sound Oscar, the ADR is terrible in this movie. Yeah, it's very terrible. It's awful. So the T word, Davey's least favorite topic. I did want to talk about some themes here, like, and see if we can dig into the themes of this movie real quick before we got to the brackets. Davey, any of the themes of the movie occur to you while watching? Well, I mean, I... I, I, I Themes, uh, more symbolism. I, 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 I thought that it was a little heavy-handed. With here's the cricket trapped. Here's the mouse trapped. Just like he's trapped. That's one of the themes that I have. It's a theme that I haven't exactly figured out of what they're trying to say. But definitely, <laughs> it was, it was highlighted. Wherever he was, he was in prison. Whether it was the Forbidden City, whether it was Man Chu Kuo, where it didn't seem like he was in prison, but he was really a prisoner of the Japanese, and of course the actual prison he was in, in communist Manchuria. That's definitely a theme. I haven't exactly figured out what the film's perspective is on this concept of imprisonment or this character's imprisonment. Is it imprisoning the old world? Like, I'm not exactly sure what it's trying to say about that. James, I have more themes, but do you have any insight to this theme of imprisonment? Well, it seems to be the central hook of the story. You know, what gets you green light, green lit on the, the story is that central irony of being uh, in an opulous pal palace and having everything you could ever want except your your freedom and you know being being trapped in there. I just want to talk about the themes of like abandonment as well. Well, now's yeah. the time. Go ahead, abandonment. Yeah, so we see Take him away. keep getting abandoned over and over again. You know, he doesn't get to go see his mom after she dies. He gets really upset about that, and Peter O'Toole has to like get him off a roof. His ama, his Chinese teacher, saying goodbye to he does get to say goodbye to Peter O'Toole. So that was like a tender moment where they reenact the first time they met with that vigorous handshake. So he gets a band to play "Old Lang Syne" as he walks out. <laughs> yeah, that was great. And then he gets uh, abandoned by his consort, you know, wife number two, and then eventually, when wife number one is shuttled off after her you know, accidental abortion, which was rearranged by the Japanese, uh, he kind of reenacts another uh, the motif is like him chasing to uh, to catch up yeah. with her, like was, he tried earlier in the film. It was an film. exact echo. Yeah. And it, it was almost a little heavy handed in, in the way it exactly yeah. echoed the previous one with the red doors. And he even had to mumble, John Lone was forced to mumble, open the door. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> but at the very end, when uh, he's been humbled, uh, and we have that cute little scene at the end it, when he visits the palace and his little boy comes up to him. Cute. Does he have the last abandonment laugh? Because he, <laughs> he hands the kid the cricket. The kid, kid opens up and sees this cricket, which implausibly has survived these many years. And then the kid looks up. Crickets will live 60 years, man. Don't mess with the crickets. Okay. I guess. They're like turtles. And he looks up. And the cricket finally escapes. Right, right. Finally, escapes. So he escapes, but then the kid looks up and the emperor has gone, he's disappeared. So it's kind of like the emperor is abandoned to us in a sense, right? Well, he died. But not yeah. in that scene, he didn't die. <laughs> he did. It's. I feel like it's a metaphor for his death. Yeah, it's a metaphor. <laughs> okay. I, I do think so. All right, so some of the themes that I had here um, that might be related to the imprisonment and the abandonment somehow um, 
is it, I really feel like it was about, to some degree, the death of imperialism. China isn't the only empire in the film to fall, and I feel like that's a constant theme of the concept of imperialism, nation building, etc., and how that is part of the old world and not really have a place in modern day society. So that's something I sort of took from it. And also, to some degree, I felt like there was something about the hollowness of political ideology in general. It's as if to say the current movements don't seem to matter historically. Nothing seems to last too long. They seem to be replaced. Even the kind of communists that imprisoned him in the 50s were replaced by the Mao Zedong communists, and his captors were suddenly captured themselves, and it's the cycle continues. And it's almost as if, you know, it's this constant cycle of, of human life. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's quite an irony when he sees his governor from the prison wearing a dunce hat being paraded through the street and he defends him. A wonderful actor, by the way. I had to look him up, Ying Ruochen. Apparently, he's like a translator of Shakespeare into Chinese, by the way. Trivia tidbit from James. There you go. He, he also brought Death of a Salesman to China. Wow. And yeah, it's about the arbitrariness of these political movements, right? It's yeah, like you're, yeah. On one, you're on top one moment and then... However, I hear that Bertolucci is a Marxist. And so I'm curious what the comparison would be between his view of China and the Cultural Revolution and communism versus like the American view when this film came out. And you already referred to modern day China, which is yeah. you still communist, but it's really, really more and more capitalist by the day in terms of their financial situation and the way they're buying into America. It's almost as if it's not the communists of the 70s and 80s anymore. It's it's this whole yeah. new sense. It's not it doesn't even feel socialist or communist. And, you know, I don't know too much about it. So maybe I'm talking out of my butt a little bit, but Davey, anything on these political sort of themes that I've been thinking about? Well, I think I think it's actually uh, not entirely communist. I think they have this, like zones, uh, free market zones. Further proof about the evolution of constant evolution of politics, particularly in China, which continues to be have somewhat of an unrest in that regard. Yeah, I, I definitely think that, that um, you know, he was... Uh, I guess I guess that makes it a theme, you know, the the, the changing of the ideology and 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 how, you know, they, you you know, they'll, they'll they'll talk about you know ten thousand years for the emperor. Everything is thought to be forever, and then it never is. So the massive change, of course, for the whole film is I mean, it's called the last emperor because we're going from from one extreme to the other. You know, where you're not to be into... confused with the last Jedi, which we reviewed a week ago. But go ahead. Right, right. Or all the other last films. I mean, this has to be the most common type of title, the last fill in the blank. I mean, I, I looked Our it up on IMDb. The last Starfighter. The last Starfighter. I, hey, that's one of my favorite lasts. Yeah, definitely better than like The <laughs> Last Samurai. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about The Last Samurai. Yeah. yeah. So you're going from Imperial where you are born and he's born into being a god, you know, just like let's celebrate this one individual to communism being the complete opposite, where we don't have gods, for one thing, and we don't have individuals. It's all about the collective. That's, of course, rubbed American individualists the wrong way for years, and I'm curious what the attitude was when this film came out, because this is in the middle of the Cold War when this film won Best Picture. You know, We're going head-to-head -head with Russia, but China was kind of derided because they're even worse, because they're communists and all about the collective, but they're not as successful as Russia, and they're poor. Well, of course, 30 years hence, the times have changed and China may overtake the United States pretty soon in terms of their contribution to the world economy. I would say that I do think that by 1987, you know, as we talked about in 1990, perestroika a little bit, and I do think things between U.S. and Russia and to some degree U.S. and China were thawing yeah, yeah. a little yeah. bit. It was, it was the beginning of the thaw because don't forget the right. wall comes down in 1989, uh, two years, years after this. Yeah, so guys, are, are we ready to move on to the, the bracket situation? I just want to say one thing. I mean, you yeah. mentioned uh, you didn't like the uh, interrogation scenes. Um, well, I, I didn't like them as a device for yeah. exposition. What I did like is I, I'm just not used to, you know, watching, you know, the, the interrogations that happen during that cultural revolution uh, in all the communist countries fascinate me because like in the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution, they don't use interrogation like re rehabilitation they just chop your head off you know if you're a king especially or an emperor they're just going to kill you but you know john what's his name john lone this actor john he, lone. Actually, he ended right now on broadway is uh m butterfly which also deals with some similar themes it takes place during a cultural revolution 
But isn't, isn't John Lone in the film version? That's why I brought him up. He plays opposite Jeremy Irons in the film. Both that play and this Last Emperor film reminded me of how unique the interrogations in the communist regime is. They are trying to help you out. They're trying to like rehabilitate you. And of course, we America is going to say, oh, that's brainwashing. It's a lot more benign than uh, the kind of like torture, confess, and then we hang you type of interrogations we've seen in other revolutions. Full disclosure, everybody, James is a direct competitor with our other member, Jim, because Jim, of course, works for Playbill. <laughs> James works for Broadway.com. So they are direct competitors. And you will constantly hear theater references from both Jim Carroll and James Monaghan here. So that'll be a theme whenever we have them on. Yeah, Clive Owen is giving an amazing performance in M. Butterfly on Broadway right now. Bonus review. Bonus theater review here on the No Name Cinema Society. We have tried. We're I'm charging for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I might charge you, you know. Maybe you're gonna run to New York to see M. Butterfly. Well, I'm I'm heading up there Sunday, so. Uh, it's time for the classic movie showdown. Woo! <sighs> Basically, the idea is we have tons of brackets. We have brackets of decades. We have all the best picture winners. We've got all the best original screenplay winners. We got sci-fi bracket. We've got a westerns bracket. All different types of categories of brackets, which work very similar to the NCAA tournament. For those of you that are familiar with March Madness. Um, to explain it a little bit further, we go to our rules expert. Drunk David will read the rules. All right, so the uh, seating criteria varies from bracket to bracket. Films are shown at JV-hosted screenings, and they need to be 15 years or older. That means from 2002. 2003 is going to be in play as of our next episode. Voters are eligible if they see both films within a 12-month period. They must see both films in JV's presence. JV is ineligible to vote. Unless the vote counts, he can break ties. The there you go. Breaker. That might have been Davey's best reading of the rules ever. Wasn't he pretty good, James? Oh, he was wonderful. You have, you have a career ahead of you as a rule reader. <laughs> nice. Nobody needs a lawyer or They need a rule reader. So. Right. <laughs> well, too many lawyers. laws are rules. So <laughs> it's kind of the same thing. All right, guys. So it's time for me to announce the bracket. Tonight's bracket is the best picture bracket. So this is a bracket of... Best Picture winners historically. Um, so there's 64 of the 88 Best Picture winners made the bracket. Um, and on this, uh, and I, I mentioned The Last Emperor, of course, is celebrating the 30th anniversary of its win. Um, on the Best Picture bracket, The Last Emperor is a 16 seed, which is Ooh, uh, one of the lower seeds that you can have, the lowest possible seed. So, Davey, if it's a 16 seed, it's going up against a... Number one. A one seed. So this is the toughest, Ooh. toughest Ouch. matchup here. 16 seed, they have to go up against a number one seed. Um, so the 16 last emperor goes up against Casablanca, best picture winner from 1943. Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we screen Casablanca, if you remember, on New Year's Eve. Uh, there's a vlog from it where Jay Money and I have to hug each other. Um, and uh, so we saw it on New Year's Eve, and then we screened this in March of uh, 2017. Uh, so it was in four months of each other. So that's where the vote comes from. Um, I'm not going to tell these guys. The vote is final. The, at, the vote happened at the screening. But I'm going to let, and neither of these guys, James wasn't at that particular screening. So um, I'm going to let these guys opine before I reveal the actual opine. winner. And uh, Davey. The you and Jay Money hugging uh, scene, that kind of kind of falls into place with the with the regime change and the, uh, the nothing's forever uh, <laughs> theme Fair point. of this show. The, our theme, our theme of abandonment is that. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. I'm glad we did that. Uh, who, who? Oh, Casablanca, right? By the way, before you vote, for those of you who are curious, we just did a show on Casablanca in our screening. Casablanca in episode 41.3. So it's about four episodes ago. I think it was in July, early August. James, I don't suppose you watched our episode on Casablanca. I'm sorry. Don't hate me. Okay. But I do think it's one of our better episodes as I look back on the year in general. Like it's one of our stronger episodes. I always worry that we weren't going to be able to bring new stuff to the table in Casablanca, but I really think we did. I really think we well, had we broke new ground on Casablanca. I'll check it out. He's being facetious to, to get no, my no, goat, I but I, I do think we did a pretty good job. Of course we did. We always do a great job. I'm sure you did. Maybe. Have, you, have you seen the Hot Pursuit episode? <laughs> That's the oh. one where you were actually drunk. The Hot Pursuit episode is one of our top, what is it, five, top five, top six best episodes ever? Oh, it's also like, one of our five oldest. It's number nine. It's episode number nine. But How, how do you know? All right, uh, I'm gonna, let's play a game real quick. Uh, what number is, is uh, Child 44? Seven. 
That's sick. That's sick. <laughs> so, Davey, Casablanca no, no, better. Come on, it's this stupid. But why would we compare this? Casablanca is one of the best movies of all time. It wins. Okay, so uh, Davey says Casablanca. Uh -huh. James, what do you think? Well, Rick, in a sense, is the emperor of his cafe, isn't he? There's some similarities there. The difference is he can leave his palace, right? <laughs> but, but he chooses not to. So I think that gets, to, right, that gets to the real difference between these protagonists. You know, morally speaking, the emperor and the last emperor is a very passive character, very narcissist. And as you pointed out earlier, we can understand why he's a narcissist and a brat. We can understand why he's kind of similar to a certain leader we have in the White House right now. <laughs> I mean, I can see Trump saying to Peter O'Toole, you know, the president doesn't get examined. <laughs> Remember that <laughs> scene? <laughs> or nobody divorces me, which is another line from The Last Emperor. A very Trump-like, I thought. I can see the emperor tweeting, tweeting out that kind of thing. But uh, he, but I think what, what really breaks the character is actually early on, was he, I was watching this film with my wife. And the scene where he throws the mouse and kills the mouse, that did it for her. She bailed. She was like, I can't care about this character. I can't like him. Did she actually walk out? Because we have a theme. Our panelists watch the classics with their wives, and their wives have walked out of each of them. Yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> she basically walked out. Walked out, out. That was the breaking point for her. She was gone. Wow. You know? and she missed I walked out of here. All the wives are walking out. I walked David. out. You can't hurt an animal in a film. I mean, it's probably, you know, probably the only worst thing is maybe hurting a child, but that's debatable. It might be even worse to hurt an animal. Let's have that debate another time. The mouse moment was impactful, and I do think they actually killed several mice to get that. Wow. Okay. Well, Italian cinema with the, with the uh, horror movies, right? They, they do yeah. a lot of that. They did. Yeah. I don't know. I'm it sure was they a don't. bad practice that, like, taking care of animals didn't really, like, really start to happen until the 90s in movies. So, yeah. So instead Jim. of being a narcissist, Rick does the opposite. He makes the ultimate classic selfless move at the end, right? He could get a ticket out of there, but he, he lets these other people go, and he lets go of his girl. One of the most memorable you know, moral acts in all of cinema. He's a true hero, and for that reason alone, I would go with Casablanca here. Okay, wouldn't you say there's like a thousand other reasons as well? I only need that reason, but there okay, are. Fair enough. You're, right, you're one, right, you're right. There uh, are thousands of other reasons. I obviously agree with you, but here's what the folks said. Uh, the winner is... The winner is Casablanca, and it was unanimous. Uh, Casablanca moves on in the best picture bracket um, to take on the eight or nine seed. Um, and that that result will come up in a future episode in 2018 we do have the sweet 16 matchup of whatever whatever casablanca goes up against i i know what it goes up against but i'm not going to tell these guys so keep an eye out so casablanca moves on and we'll see if it moves on to the sweet 16. so guys any uh any reactions uh, that's about what you expected right. i would have quit i would have quit this <laughs> that would have been last ever heard one okay <laughs> Some strong reactions from uh, from uh, from Davy Joe. All right, a very thorough discussion tonight, guys. Uh, how do you guys? Uh, I'm I'm about to close things out. Do you guys have anything you want to say to the audience about Last Emperor or anything or James's first show? Well, just about Casablanca. You know, maybe I would have voted for Last Emperor at the very last scene when the kid gets the cricket from the emperor and opens it up. He says to the cricket, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> like that. That, that would have put it over the top, huh? <laughs> that would have been over the top. I was afraid of watching The Last Emperor because of what I've heard about its length. But I'm really glad you picked this movie and invited me to do this because I'm really glad I finally watched the movie. It held my attention. It's not a perfect film well, by any stretch. Too. I do think you liked it better than either of us, but I'm, I'm glad you watched it as well. And I, I don't hate the movie, but I do find it really problematic and certainly not worthy of a best picture win. I don't hate it either. So I'm glad I saw it, but you know, I'm done. I'm done it, with it. It. It, it was your first time as well, Davey? Oh yeah, I was really worried about it too. <laughs> so bad, but not as bad as you thought is, is what it sounds like to me. It was all right, it was all right, it was fine. I'm glad I saw it. My favorite line was, don't tell anyone about my mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Which you have said to me on a number of occasions, so it's, it, it's fitting <laughs> you like that line. <laughs> you, you weren't supposed to tell anyone. <laughs> oh, and here we are on the internet oh. live and everything. I'll tell you uh, what, though. All right, so guys. Secret, this is the show to do it on since nobody watches it. <laughs> <laughs> People will watch now that James is on it. James is oh. our secret to the success. Okay. okay. I want to thank you, JB, for your trivia knowledge because I'm shocked 
did you reveal in this episode that M it was Empire of the Sun that wasn't nominated for a Best Picture? Correct. Hope and Glory was. Empire of the Sun was not. The wow. five nominees, as I recall, was Hope and Glory, Last Emperor, Moonstruck, uh, <clears throat> Hope and Glory, Moonstruck, 1987. What am I? My Fatal forgetting? Attraction. Fatal Attraction. That is. Um, and broadcast that News. Is, broadcast News. No Empire of the Sun. It's a great um, film. I think it's, uh, it's a good film. Although the, my favorite film from 1987 that was not nominated, uh, that is top 25 all time for me. It did win Best Supporting Actor though, and you already brought up Sean Connery. The Untouchables is a film that I love, mm. and Moonstruck is also in my top 50 of all time. So uh, tonight we celebrate the 30th anniversary of The Last Emperor from 1987. And even though next classic is technically beyond 2018, it's still part of the 2017 season, and we'll be celebrating a 50th anniversary. In other words, a film from 1967. And it was a film that was so controversial that it got the most read film reviewer in the country fired after he wrote three reviews, one pan and two more reviews to defend the pan for this movie that was one of the zeitgeist movies of 1967. Uh, the next show up we have, however, is our sound off, our freeform segment that's coming up this Tuesday, January 2nd. As I said before, I'm going to play some games with these guys. Devin will be back. And I'm going to do an obscure movie review from a film from 1966. And Davey has asked me to count down my top five performances in a Star Wars movie. And that's coming up on the next Sound Off this Tuesday. All right, guys, you want to say goodnight to these guys and Happy New Year? Happy New Year, everyone. Happy holidays. And thank you, Emma Stone, for you know standing by uh, JB through this entire episode, listening to him blab on and on. I mean, wife number really two. really admire you. <laughs> <laughs> that means she's going to leave you first, though, according to the film. <laughs> Davey, anything you want to say to the audience? Why don't you subscribe to the channel? Ah, do it. Maybe maybe James should subscribe to the channel now that he's on. <laughs> That's an idea. I'll subscribe. I mean, you put it on my Facebook timeline, so yeah, might as well subscribe. <laughs> They're not going to hurt yeah. anybody. Um, and James, by the way, you did a great job tonight. Thank you for coming on and joining the society. We're very excited to have you as a member. We hope to see you on more shows in 2018. Yeah, thanks, man. Thank you. I appreciate hanging out with you guys. Uh, and I hope I can escape this forbidden city. <laughs> I hope so, too, for all our sakes. Um, so to the audience, I want to say to you guys, Happy New Year. Be safe on, uh, on Sunday night and have a great time. And we'll see you in 2018. But for now, this meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is adjourned. Adjourned. <laughs>